Let's um, come back together for the final panel. And um, just as we're gathering, uh, you know, this is actually the, the first of four events that we're doing at the forum today. Um, so, you know, it'll be a, a, a fun day. So actually the first of five events if you count the after party. Um, so we have this day-long strategy session. Then after this, we have a debrief meeting with the leadership council and the host committee. Then we have a reception. And then we have our annual uh, fundraiser, Keepers of the American Dream. And then we have our after party, which will include a lot of bad karaoke. Um, I'm just seeing if anybody's still listening. OK. All right, well, thank you very much again for everybody, everybody for joining us. Um, you know, this last panel is just incredibly important because I think our success up to this point and our success moving forward is based on our ability to tell a powerful story. And what we have found that by telling the story through the voices and the, and the perspectives of messengers from faith, law enforcement, business, the veterans community, what happens is that the, 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 um, the voter begins to hear from somebody that they trust. So oftentimes when I'm in Silicon Valley and they say, you know what? We need another H-1B, and I'll say, well, you know, that's great, but until we convince the voter in Missouri that another, another H-1B visa is not, you know, just another, quote, immigrant, but it's actually another new American, we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, we're not going to win that debate. So this is really about a conversation about people, their contributions, and where we're going as a country. So uh, before I introduce uh, this final panel, I also want to really thank um, our sponsors and uh, the board of the front you'll see the, the long list of sponsors that have really made today the entirety of today a, a possibility but uh, I just want to really thank and, and acknowledge um, the, the top the top three or four sponsors first is Walmart uh, Mark Espinoza is here from Walmart and thank you very much Mark and Walmart for being such an incredible partner with uh, with the forum and with this issue overall so I re really really appreciate it And then the other uh, top uh, sponsor for the, the day is, is Western Union. I'm not sure if they were able to make it during the day, but um, Tim Daly, uh, Hikmet uh, Ersek, who's their CEO, we honored a couple of years ago. And ever since, not even since then, but even before then, they've been real champions of uh, immigration reform, but also the work that we do, on a, all of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this next panel, uh, the moderator is Helen Aguirre Ferre. And Helen, I got to know in, in Miami, uh, she has her own uh, syndicated uh, Univision uh, uh, radio show. She has her own uh, local um, television show in, in Miami. But more than that, she's somebody who has the pulse, uh, uh, has her finger on the pulse of what's happening within Hispanic politics, within Hispanic media, but also how the, what the role is and the, the, the potential is of the Latino community, much less the immigrant community writ large. Um, Stephen Bauman from World Relief has been a great partner for us for many, many years, is uh, the featured speaker. Randy Johnson from the uh, Chamber, U.S. Chamber of Commerce here uh, will be speaking, as well as our good friend Barbara Camp from Technology Credit Union. So, turn it over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much. So delighted to be here. This, of course, is such an important conversation for all of us. And it certainly has been an important story for our uh, Hispanic community, our Latino community, and for Univision as well. The power of the story, words matter. We know that in media, and we know that in politics. We also know that it's important uh, for our panel, and in particular for our uh, featured speaker, Stephen Bauman. He's the president and CEO of World Relief, an international relief and development organization that serves five million vulnerable people each year throughout more than 100,000 church-based volunteers. Incredible organization, incredible man, Stephen. Thank you, it's an honor to be here as well uh, with uh, all of you that are working on this issue, my colleagues from World Relief. Um, I travel often, in fact, I just came in from Chicago yesterday in Columbus, Ohio. The question I often get is this, Stephen, how can you support breaking the law? Yeah, and uh, now sometimes the more bold people will say, Stephen, how can you support illegals? 
Others may not say anything at all, but they're thinking it. So I respond this way. Tell me about your family. How, how are you doing? And I sort of break the ice. Then I ask them this question. If you had two kids, or if you do have three or four kids, tell me about your kids. And you were living in, uh, say, Latin America, say, Mexico. And if you were working hard, uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week in a local factory that was producing uh, car parts for the United States, and your local factory went bankrupt, went under because of the economic crisis, and you lost your job, and you were without work, and you couldn't put food on the table like you were when you had your job, and your wife is embarrassed because she can't make the tortillas, and she's running out of the flour that she normally buys, so she goes out and she gets a loan from a local money lender. She doesn't tell you about it. And over time, she's built up those loans, and finally she has to admit to you that you're indebted to this amount of money and at an interest rate that uh, borders extortionary. If you were a father and you're looking at your kids like I look at my kids, and if I was there, what would I say to my kids? I'm sorry, Joshua and Caleb. I don't have enough money to buy more flowers so we can have more tortillas. What would I do? What would I do? Bearing in mind that 45% of Mexico is under the poverty line, so I'm middle class, and if I was in Mexico, I would be most likely in that 45%. Would I cross the border? Would I take out a little bit more of a loan, another $3,000 to pay a, a coyote to get me across the border to go and meet with my cousins up in the north part of the United States and see if I can get a job? and send that money back home to my wife and my kids that uh, they hope that they can come across the border one day as well. The power of story, this story, putting them in that story, putting myself in that story, starts to sort of melt the hearts away from these sort of polarizing words of illegal and amnesty. We've found incredible movement in people's hearts just by that story. Sometimes the next question that comes, you have probably received this question too. Well, why, why can't they just stand in line like my great-grandfather did? Why can't we just do the legal way? Why do I have to cross the border? And what's this idea about creating a Social Security card? And you all know that they pay taxes, and those taxes that are built up in the treasury of six and seven billion a year never come back to those people, yet they're still willing to pay. So I tell him the story of my great, great, great grandfather, Heinrich, who left Germany by boat to come to New York City. And this was before Ellis Island came to the Castle Rock Immigration Processing Center in Lower Manhattan, 1854. Now, what he had to do in terms of becoming legal was pretty amazing. He stood in line, and he met a doctor. The doctor checked him out for his health. It took six seconds. In six seconds, he determined that he was healthy, took a piece of chalk and marked it right across his arm on his clothing. This one's healthy. Go to the next stop. Next station, he talked about his name. His name was spelled B-A-U-M-A-N-N. And they said, nah, it's too complicated. You need to take an N off that thing. Make it simpler. <laughs> so you notice my name. If I go to Germany, they spell it with two Ns, of course. And that was it. He was legal. 1854, he came into this country. He left his country in Germany because of hard times. I'm not sure, but maybe he couldn't feed his kids like my brother, my sister across the border in Mexico and other parts of the world that stared at the faces of their hungry kids. He had a six-second medical check. He dropped an N on his name. He became legal. Power of story, my story, starts to shape and mold and melt the hearts of the people that we work with across the country. We've seen significant, a sea change in people because of story, personal story. But I want to let you know a secret as well. Um, I represent the Bibles aspect of the Bibles and business and badges. So I usually represent the Bibles perspective, but I had to lean over a little bit to the business side because there is a driver on the faith uh, equation that is, that would make Adam Smith proud, self-interest. 
So churches, yes, it's moral, it's right, it's biblical, and there's the power of story. These are real people. These are our brothers and sisters. The fastest growing churches in our country, fastest growing evangelical churches, which I represent and see all the time, these denominations, are immigrant churches. And so, wow, something happened in our midst. It's not they and us and them and we, and it's us together. They are us. So the power of story is not just the individual story, it's the meta narrative. What's happening in our faith tradition in this country is profound and I would argue exciting. There's another meta narrative as well, and it's the immigrants serving their brothers and sisters. Powerful stories. And if anything, we Anglos that are trying to mobilize and create movement on this issue need to follow our immigrant brothers and sisters who have been working on this for 10, 20, 30 years. We have so much to learn from them. I just learned from my colleagues yesterday that an alliance that we've been helping to seed was launched called the Immigrant Alliance. This is churches and denominations that come together that are actually not just advocating for policy change, but actually on the ground doing the work of legalization, even now in the broken system, something that we believe does as well across the country. Last thought, I want to quote someone you all know, although he's been dead for a long time. Alex de Tocqueville, early 1800s, came to our country. He was a French diplomat. And he came to our country to study how this experiment was working. Why has it seemed to be successful? He was aspirational for a political appointment back in France. So he was hoping to prove himself. He came and he studied our culture. He studied our communities. He studied our, our ethic. He said, I've, he said this. I've seen Americans making great and sincere sacrifices for the key common good. And a hundred times, I have noticed that when needs be, they almost always give each other faithful support. And he went on to say that that faithful support was beyond bloodlines. It wasn't just my own family, your own family. It was people. It was Americans. And then he said this, my favorite, one of my favorite things he said. America is great because she is good. If America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Now, people have said things like this through the centuries. The measure of a civilization is how it treats its weakest members. Gandhi said that. Pearl S. Buck, great literature writer, the test of a civilization is the way that it cares for its helpless members. Pope John Paul II, any society, any nation is judged on the basis of how it treats its weakest members. What if it's not so much our innovation, our resources, our military strength? What if it's not even our uh, economy in the end? But we're judged, we're great as a nation because we open wide the doors to our brothers and sisters, not just my grandfather Heinrich, but Jose from Mexico today and refugees from Burma and Bhutan and Iraq. That's what makes us great. When I look into the eyes of my kids, I want to say we are a great country because we let people in. We don't just care about ourselves. We care about others. Thank God for the power of story, not just my grandfather, but your story. No matter how many generations, if you were to take a poll in this room, every one of you is an immigrant of some shape or form, unless there's an American uh, original Indian here. And then we should stand, sit down and applaud them. You've probably seen the, the uh, cartoons that come across some of the news waves. It's a picture of an American Indian in sort of full regalia. Ah, so you struggle with immigration. Great, splendid, when do you leave? So we're all immigrants. We all have a story. We have a story to tell, and we should share that story. It's very powerful, and there's a meta-narrative in our faith community that is very powerful, very important to us as that faith community shifts. With it shifts votes, and we need their votes. We need them to care. We need to care like um, Tocqueville called us to care, care for one another. So thank you for these, uh, this time, and we're going to turn now to a panel, so I look forward to it. Thank you. Come on up.
Well, Stephen Bauman, you heard, <laughs> and like now we have uh, Barbara Cam. He's, she's president and CEO of Technology Credit Union, a $1.8 billion financial institution. And uh, to her left, Randy Johnson, Senior Vice President of Labor, Immigration, and Employee Benefits at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. In the previous panel, uh, James Gill said that the message has been distorted and someone has to take over the narrative. And our panel is about talking about the American story. Stephen, you were talking about how important the personal message is, and each of us has a story. There's no question. But you also said illegals. I remember not too long ago, aliens was the term for those who are undocumented. These are polarizing words, mm. words that either you warm up to or you close down. So how do you get past those words? And particularly today, how difficult is it to tell a story when we have a media that is so fragmented? It is hard to get the story. We tend to sing to the choir. What we need to do is take the story out of our comfort zone and take it somewhere else, but it's not always friendly territory. Yeah, um, we try and do two things. One is tell the, tell the story from an individual point of view, but also <coughs> in our faith communities, the biblical story. So Jesus was an immigrant. And so as we tell that story and help people return back to the Bible, what does the Bible say about the stranger is the language in the Bible? The alien is that language. 92 times in the Old Testament and many more in the New. So calling, I mean, I, I have to believe that every American, and, uh, and if anything, gosh, I pray the faith community would lead this, that we're at, at our deepest core, we're altruistic. Like, to Tocqueville recognized, that we care about others, not just our own sort of self-interest. And so telling the story of the Bible, telling the story of our faith, telling the story of our faith communities and those people, I just, I, I've seen people rise beyond their own self-interest. I, I mean, it's generally a spirit of fear, and those polarizing words create and sort of flame that spirit of fear. Wait a minute, friends, we're not here just for ourselves. That's the great experiment of this country is for others. So when we tell the story, we see people kind of back away from those words. And it's not just a story, but you can give rational uh, proposition regarding those polarizing words. It says, no, it doesn't have to be about amnesty. It doesn't have to be about breaking the law. There can be recompense made. There can be fines paid. And many, all the immigrants that I know say, we're willing to do whatever it takes. We can talk about border security. So there's a very sort of common ground in the middle that we can talk about as we tell the story. And we see, we see movement. We do see movement. And we're very hopeful and confident that it's just a matter of time before policy shifts. And it's going to require a lot of leadership. And there is leadership that we do see when we look at most definitely from the business community and this is an area where it's most outspoken. How important is telling that message and how complicated is it to tell that message, Barbara, from the business perspective? It's actually not very complicated to tell the story because it's a great story. So I come from Silicon Valley and you've all heard of Jerry Yang of Yahoo, Sergey Brin of Google. They're the big stories, the immigrant stories, but. We at my company work with about 400 what we call member companies. These are big companies, small companies, and just two stories, Brocade, a big company, a two point something billion uh, in, in revenue company, four plus billion in market cap, employs over 4,000 employees. That was co-founded by a fellow who came from India, went to Germany to study engineering, yeah. went to Toronto, Canada to get his PhD, <clears throat> ended up in Silicon Valley, started out with a couple of little companies, and he founded Brocade. On the other side, we have Wei Li Dai, who is the co-founder of Marvell. Wei Li was raised in Shanghai, China came to Berkeley to study engineering, mm -hmm. fell in love with a fellow uh, Berkeley student, stayed, and she and her husband co-founded Marvell. It employs over 7,000 people today, a market cap of over 6 billion, revenue of over 4 billion. 
These kinds of people who have come to Silicon Valley, and they're throughout our country, in Silicon Valley alone have created over 500,000 jobs. And so it's very easy to tell those kinds of stories. We just need to make sure that they get spread a lot further. There's no question about that. And I made a mistake in starting in that we have, uh, we have a live poll that we're doing. So everyone, please take a look at the screens and take out your phones, tablet or laptop. We have a poll that we're going to be looking at. And what most influences your thinking on a policy like immigration? Personal story, date and facts, respected messengers. You can use text keyword to 20 by uh, dialing the word or plugging in 22333 or submit your responses at pollev.com slash I2020. And we're starting to see that Personal stories is still ahead. Personal stories being personal story. Wow. Well, I would say it's like near unanimous, Randy, that personal stories is what uh, really influences the way a person yeah. thinks about immigration story. And whether you are in favor of immigration reform or not, a lot has to do with the personal story that goes with that. Well, I've been doing this about 15 years, so I've come from the city of lots of scars on my back. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the thing about the personal stories, it, it, when, 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 uh, when Stephen was talking, it brought me back to, uh, I don't know why I was sitting over there, the Americans with Disabilities Act, first thing I worked on in Capitol Hill in 1990. And the disability community is, to their credit, is very good in, in coming in and lobbying members of Congress and telling about their personal stories and, and disabilities and, and how that disability affects their ability. This is back in 1990, pre-ADA. And, and members of Congress are, are not, are not, uh, you know, not cold-hearted. They listen to those and they're sympathetic. The diff and, and what happened? Well, the ADA went through in about a year and a half. Uh, and they are very, very good lobbyists. We got some reforms done in the Americans with Disabilities Act just a few years ago. The difference here, though, I have to, to tell the crowd is, and so I'd probably disagree with it, I'd be the number one in the other camp, uh, is here it's different. It really is, because personal stories of immigrants are one thing, but, but as, you, as you sort of alluded to, you've got to translate that into how that creates jobs for Americans. And the biggest problem I run into on Capitol Hill these days, and I think we've beaten the amnesty thing, it's, it's come up in some recent elections, unfortunately, in some, what the U.S. Chamber endorsed some candidates, and they were accused of supporting amnesty because they were U.S. Chamber of Commerce candidates. But overall, I think we have beaten the amnesty argument over the last five years. Once you talk to a member and you say, why the Senate bill is not amnesty because of X, Y, Z. No one supports amnesty. That's complete bullshit. It's just a straw man. What really keeps coming up is, Okay, fine, but these people are coming in, and what I hear back home is they're taking away jobs from Americans. And the high-skilled argument, finally, I think, after 10 years, we've almost won. And yeah. people say, well, we could probably get an H-1B bill through because of that. I'd say five years ago, we couldn't have done that. It's the lesser skill and the competition that occurs. Now, my brother, my brother, um, he, was a, he, was, he, had, he had a small shop where he, where he fixed cars up. High school degree, never graduated from college. And we get in arguments about this, and that's because the shop down the road was opened up by some very hardworking Mexicans, Latinos. I don't know whether they're legal or not. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is he saw them as competition. They'd come here, and that's competition he wouldn't have otherwise had. So it's, it's a story about a static pie, and that pie is being taken away by people who are coming here legally or eagerly, legally. And that's funny. When you talk to congressmen about this, you, you burrow down on that, and you say, well, congressman, so actually you're really talking about you're opposed to legal immigration and illegal because more people are coming here and competing for jobs. So what we've tried to do at the chamber is, is pull together, and this part of this conference, is pull together stories about how, how really the unskilled immigrants have come to this country, created jobs on Main Street. Everyone knows sort of about the Googles now and, and the Intels. That's the story I think at least two years ago was being un, untold about the lesser skilled and the jobs they're creating on Main Street that helps Americans turned out to be very hard to document. We're trying to do the best job we can on that. Uh, and the other part is, of course, collection of, of individual stories. And you know, we've got the story of doctor, a doctor who came over, well, he came over illegally, worked in the farms, got to Harvard. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a professor at Harvard now. He's an MD, and an incredible story. And people sympathize with those. But again, it comes back around to 
Okay, but how many of those are, are really coming across the border? It's most of these guys who are coming in lesser skilled. Yeah, they work hard. But they're taking away jobs from Americans. And that's where I think the personal story only gets you so far in this area. You've got to say personal story, hard work, entrepreneurs, and it's good for Americans. Not good for America. Listen, good for Americans because they create jobs for Americans. And so actually expanding the pie. But the personal stories alone, I just don't think... They're not going to get us there, and they haven't got us there so yet. So for you, it's personal stories plus da data and facts that have to uh, accompany that. Data and facts that show that this is part of expanding the American pie and creating jobs for Americans who are already here. But isn't it to right. some degree, too, part of the problem that we have forgotten or have become disconnected with what the real American story is? The real American story isn't someone who's necessarily been in this country for the last 15 generations. The American story is the opportunity of people coming to the shores, looking for freedom, be it political or economic. I mean, that was the underlying idea. When you talk about, you know, the, the, the religious part of freedom and all that it entails, the first who arrived here from Europe came for religious mm -hmm. freedom. Yeah. That was the basis. So if you come here regardless, freedom is the underlying word. We seem to have forgotten, or at least this debate comes to what does it mean to be American? And while you were talking, Barbara, about your experience in Silicon Valley and in the technology field, it's in a way reflective of very few of those are Hispanic. In a way, what we're looking at is and a fear of the Hispanic because Hispanics come with a different language. And because of the numbers, assimilation doesn't appear like it's quite as fast, though you ask any Hispanic family. And you can't keep the kids from learning English. It just happens anyway. Hispanics are actually assimilating. We just haven't been very good at telling the story. Hey, I would agree. Uh, you, you and I spoke earlier that a lot of the folks working in technology are uh, Indian, Chinese, Pakistani, whatever, and, and maybe there is a fear of Hispanics because we have a border there that um, they can cross at any moment if they want to come up here and get jobs. But the uh, lower skilled Hispanics, one of the things that can get them up the ladder is a wonderful education. And we've talked about education before. I work very closely with the community colleges in our area, with the Foothill De Anza Community College. And this is a place, community colleges, where people of lesser means can get great educations with not a lot of time put in and certainly not a, a lot of money put in. And one of the problems we have in the state of California, for example, is that our community colleges, up until recently, have only been able to offer two-year degrees. We just recently passed a bill in the state of California that will allow on a pilot basis mm -hmm. 15 campuses to offer four-year baccalaureate degrees. So we offer technical subjects that aren't offered at the UCs, the Universities of California, the Cal State Universities, automotive technology. Think about Tesla Motors that's out there in Silicon Valley, and they need a lot of techs who can come in and put the cars together or the automotive shop down the street. They need techs. And this is a place where we can get the lower skilled people into the workforce. California needs 60,000 baccalaureate degrees a year more than it's producing today. There are not enough skilled people going out into the workforce. So there's no reason why we can't take the immigrant population and help them get there. And you see, that debunks the, the myth that immigrants, are illegal taking, immigrants, or uh, undocumented, whatever you want to call it, are taking away jobs. The jobs are available, they're just not being filled. That's and that hurts true. the economy as a bottom line, Randy. Yeah, but I think, as I said, I think that we, we've, thankfully, we've, we've close to winning that. I think if we have one, that's sort of on the higher end of the jobs that even the most begrudging members, who I won't, I won't use names, have admitted we have a shortage on the higher skilled end. Although I think they all they see a finite period by which, okay, we'll accept that for a certain amount, but the American education system has to come up to snuff, and the employers, remember, many of my members, have to do their part in, in helping to improve the American educational system. So we, we engage in more homegrown talent. But until that point, yeah, there's a need. But once you penetrate sort of below that, I would say, Bachelor of Science level, 
and if you look at, at, of course, you know, we're dealing with a million immigrants coming into this country and in some number illegally. Most of those are, don't fall into that BS, not BS, Bachelor of Science uh, <laughs> level. And that's just, the, that, you can just look at the numbers and that's the way it figures out. Uh, so that, again, I think is the, the most difficult part of, of immigration reform. And if you look at trying to provide legalization for the undocumented, you say, well, they're already here, but if you legalize them, then they have a better ability to compete with American workers. And you say, well, that's, that's the right thing to do. Most of those 11 million don't follow, they don't have bachelor sciences, let's just face it. So, uh, and those are the people who are gonna speak up. I mean, the Americans who feel they're affected by this, the, the people who live in Herndon and they see the day laborers at Herndon uh, at, the, at the Home Depot or whatever, who will go to town hall meetings and raise hell with members when, when immigration reform's on the floor. And I think it's that uh, vocal minority, mm. those who make so much noise that make it's so much more difficult. And I have to tell you, I get astounded by people who proclaim strong religious values who use such harsh tones mm -hmm. toward those who very often are disadvantaged on multiple levels. It's hard to hear. Yeah, forgive us in the faith community that use that type of language. Just, it's wrong. I mean, these are brothers and sisters. Compassion, compassion is never illegal. I, I meet a lot of people who won't listen to the data. So Randall's right, Barbara's right, we need the data. They won't hear it. And so the story, real people, and when possible, introduce them. I, I say, have a, have a meal with an immigrant family. We work with refugees across the country, not just immigrants. Have a meal with them. And so the story opens the heart, and that's where the shift, I believe the shift needs to take place, particularly in parts of our country, at the heart level. When that happens, then the data is extremely important. I don't believe a shift in the heart, an openness in the heart, will be sustained without good data on the economic level, the law enforcement but, level. But it gives a comfort level for someone to be able to hear the next part of the message. Yeah and then pull back and, and pull back the fear that's out there, mm -hmm. which is being fomented by, I think, a minority in our country, and it's a powerful minority, and it's across the airwaves. So when people have a shift in a heart, a willingness to, to open their hearts, look at what the faith traditions say, the Bible says, hear stories, and then look at the data, and be honest and serious about the data, then we see shifts. Now, there's been key, uh, there's a key, in, there's a, key sh uh, a fulcrum in that, and it's leadership. So pastors and denominations, and there's a lot of them across the country. Bill Hybels took a significant risk at Willow Creek Community Church, a church of about 17, 18,000 people. He stood on his stage and went after this issue. People left Willow Creek Community Church out in Irving, Cal uh, Marinus Church out in California. A church down in Atlanta opened. Or they, they, they step up with moral courage even though they know they're going to lose people in their congregations, therefore resources and money, etc., when those leaders take a stand, tell the story, open the heart, provide the data, we see how congregations shift. And it's very powerful. And we believe that if we continue this journey, there will be enough shift in the faith community that can really significantly inform uh, policy. And I think to some degree what happens too, Stephen, is that we look for that national leader, but maybe what we need to be doing is looking for those leaders on local community levels to be able to tell this, so that when you start telling the story, it's not of somebody from another state, it's somebody who actually may not be too far away from you. Absolutely, we got involved with the Bethlehem Project, now known as the New American Workforce, relatively recently because when the National Immigration Forum came to Silicon Valley, you needed to meet people. And we became one of those companies who kind of jumped on the bandwagon early on. And what we've been doing is trying to have um, uh, conferences or press conferences where we can talk about it and spread that word in our community so that other companies, other CEOs like me, because very often it will have to be a top-down priority for an organization, will decide that this is a, an idea whose time has come. We've thrived from the immigrants in our community, whether they're the lower skilled or the higher skilled, and we need to have this conversation amongst ourselves. I think that what we hear is that there are different stories to be told about immigration. 
There's the story of for the faithful, of the faithful, which is an important component of immigration. Jesus was an immigrant. There is a business economic component that you can tell as well of how important there is. There's educational component. It all comes together. And yet at the same time, Randy, it's so difficult for the politics of it right. to what from from what do we need to tell? How do we best present that story for the political spectrum to be able to change those minds? You've said that they know it's true, but maybe they need to hear it from within their own districts and not so much from DC. Right, and good luck on that. Uh, <laughs> so, you're right, look, on the economic studies, and I thought we were, when we were going into it this year, we have more economic studies this year than we ever did in terms of, uh, from conservative economists, in which the stable of conservative economists is quite narrow, but we found them all. Uh, and uh, there's great studies out there by Doug Holtz Egan and others about the value of immigration reform to this country, expanding the economic pie and stuff. We obviously have the stories from the business community not being able to fill jobs. Uh, again, it's more definitive on the higher end than, than the, the documentation is better on the higher end than on the, on the lesser scale. Although when you talk about a roofer in Texas not being able to hire Americans in August to put, put roofs on, on houses in Texas, that's believable and people believe that. Uh, in telling the story, in back home, of course, obviously the, this time around we had the problem with half of the Republican caucus could veto a bill and no secret, those, those, those districts happen to be heavily heavily traditional American and not Latino. And so there weren't, just as a matter of counting heads and counting votes, if you looked at those districts, there's not much interest in immigration reform or much receptivity to the, to, to the need for it. Uh, so, so we've got to, and that's frustrating because you, because you, you have the hard telling stories of Stephen, that Stephen brought up. Um, if I had the answer, well, maybe we'd have a bill on the president's desk. I think We've got to uh, we've got to got to make the business community a little stronger. Uh, many of our allies who are not with us on this issue are with us on many other issues, which is which is a problem. It's pointed out to me, uh, and uh, we'll just have to keep working it and, and combining. I think the economic data, building it up with with some of the anecdotal that goes with it. But what um, are what are, are, frankly, is the pushback that we're seeing? The pushback is not because the economic data, the data isn't strong. What, what would be the pushback, Barbara? I think the pushback is a perception that their constituencies don't particularly want to see movement on this uh, or in the, in the direction that the other party wants to take it. And because both parties need to come together to have a comprehensive immigration reform, it's stalemated. Yeah. Now there's an awful lot of data, we've seen some great data here today, that if we could get this to the legislators and just keep talking about it, they would see that a lot of Americans agree on so many of these points. I personally am a Tea Party Republican, so don't throw the stones yet. Um, I very strongly believe that we have got to fix the immigration system. In Silicon Valley, if we don't get more highly skilled workers in, we're going to have serious problems competing in this country. But it's at all levels. I have a friend who was an SVP at SAP, which is a large software company out of Germany. So she came over to this country uh, from Germany. She tried for about three years to become an American citizen, and the paperwork, the, the horrendous process that they put her through was Terrible, reprehensible, and, and that's someone at the highly skilled level. You can imagine what it's like for someone who doesn't have the education, doesn't have the funds to talk to an attorney. The system is broken, it needs to be fixed. And even those of us who consider ourselves conservative Republicans who are taxed enough already know that this has to change. When you say that you're Tea Party, um, you know, there, there's the story of how the Tea Party is told and portrayed. Yes. <laughs> how many other Tea Partiers feel the way you do about immigration? Well, you know, I don't know because I am not an activist Tea Party person, but I do feel as though I'm taxed enough already and not getting much value for my taxes. You know, if you look at our education system in the state of California, and it's appallingly bad, and yet we want to keep taxing the population to keep dumping money down 
a system that isn't working particularly well. So I and many, many others are out there feeling that they're part of the Tea Party, but we don't talk to each other. We don't necessarily communicate. We're very much like a silent majority that's out there. And I think that the media portrayal of people who are part of the Tea Party is really very uh, not particularly accurate. And you see, we come back to something that I find that it's particularly challenging for these times, especially when we look at media being so fragmented. You see websites that some look very professional, but they don't have professional content on it. And those seem to be the ones that are moving the conversation, sometimes in terrible directions. Sometimes, so how yes. do we take control of this story? How do we take control of the narrative to be able to convince those who in their hearts of hearts, and everybody seems to say it, they understand it, but are just terrified. Not everybody's brave enough to stand up and take that strong position because they're gonna lose their political job. They're going to yeah. face economic scorn. The members of Congress, senators that I've met with, my colleagues Jenny Yang and Matthew Sorns meet with members all the time. We hear this all the time, and this is conservative, not just across, uh, both, both sides, bipartisan. We know this isn't hard to fix. We know that this is possible. We know that our laws currently are, don't make sense. We need help with our constituencies. So to Barbara's point, we need help with our constituents. What can you do amongst you, broad base, deep into the communities, not just the mega churches, which I mentioned, but the small churches all across this country, and so that's where we're working. And as I said, we see shift and changes there by telling the story and by producing the data. So we have our work to do, but we've got members of Congress and senators saying we can do this. Now, I think we also need those that are willing to take a real courageous step. And after the midterms, we're gonna hope for that again, to take a step as a conservative Republican, as a Democrat, to stand up and say, we're gonna get this done because it's right for our country. But they need help, too, with our constituencies, and that cuts across faith, business, and, uh, yeah, we've got our work to do. Randy, do you see this conversation being picked up in 2015? There's going to be a lot of conversation. Um, and let me compliment by the evangelical community, and they were new to, new to the fight, some of you guys, this, this time around, and I don't say new, I don't say new, I mean new in a good way. They didn't, really didn't make a lot of difference. I think there's a question, as I'm sure you would admit, Ralph, between the leadership and the, and the people in the, in the pews and how much, are they going to pick the phone up and say, get, get something done on this? And if that can happen, and it's great to hear you're working on it, maybe we can get it done. Sure, it's going to be, uh, there's the overall, there is, we don't know what's going to happen if the president, of course, goes forward with DACA. Is that going to poison the well? And the Republicans will come back and just focus on that. There is still this huge distrust of the president arising almost out of more of a, out of Obamacare than, than immigration, but then it kind of, you, you notice the, the, the lawsuit against the president is not actually over immigration, it's actually over Obamacare and the employer mandate. Um, but there is this, uh, and, and will, he, will he enforce the border at all? Uh, and so there's gonna be a lot, we're gonna continue to work on it, we're gonna work on it early next year. Uh, my boss has told me to, and I told him I will, and uh, we're gonna throw resources at it. Is there going to be a window, depending on what happens in the Senate? Uh, I think personally there will be. I'm not going to go into details and how I see that playing out. But I think to, to all of our points, it's going to take leadership along the lines of an LBJ to, who would think to step up to the plate and get this done, I think. Now, whether or not uh, in this day and age, LBJ could do things and it wouldn't be reported 30 seconds later on, you know, Politico or Twitter or something. Um, it does make things, as your point was, it makes, it makes, puts pressure on a lot of these members to react instantaneously and not get into trouble, not say anything. But, but it is going to take leadership like that and to say this is the best thing for the country. I hate to say it, I don't think it is going to be driven by constituents in conservative Republican districts, of which there's, well, half the Republican caucus. Uh, but to your point, we can make it easier at least for them to go along if the leadership steps up to get it done. I think also, in a way, uh, there's something that can be done as well as when you're telling the story. There, there's a, even a debate for those who are in favor of immigration reform, whether it should be um, uh, uh, integral immigration reform or should it be done in piecemeal fashion. And so taking control of the immigration story is one part, but then even if you want to do it piecemeal, 
take control of that story and start telling that story that immigration reform can start with border security, which is a big concern to those. And of course, it's also a concern to border states who are the first ones who feel the thrust of those who come. And we saw it with the story of the unaccompanied minors. The unaccompanied minors was a story that played out that in some ways was damaging to the political process on the House of Representatives side. They were about to present immigration reform. I have spoken to Congressman Mario Diaz-Balart on that issue. And it was stopped with the influx of unaccompanied minors, the children. And yet, at the same time, there was an overwhelming consensus that these were children mm. and that they were innocent mm. and that they should be given their due process before passing judgment, true or false. Yeah, I mean, we saw that rise in our communities, that these are children, and we, we saw them advocate for due process. And um, it was inspiring to see that. Of course, there was a great polarization and big conversation there. You know, we, the people I work with, my colleagues, the churches across this country that are advocating for this, they care about families, keeping families together. And so looking at this whole issue through the lens of families is extremely important. So you mentioned integration or comprehensive approach to reform. And we're strong advocates for that because so much of an integrated response has to do with um, families and how it would affect You know, them. when we look at the issue of children in particular, Glenn Beck, who is well known for his political views on immigration, raised in three and a half days a million dollars, and he went to the border, and he gave uh, toys and clothes to the children who are unaccompanied minors. That was huge, because he would say that immigration reform, the way it's been presented, the way it was passed in the, Republic, in, in the Senate with Marco Rubio's bill, that that was amnesty. And yet on this issue, you can find consensus, you can find aspects of a very difficult, politically difficult, complex story where you can get agreements from the far right and the far left that there's something that can be done. And that's not to say that you're, that's going to transfer into law, but at least it begins to provide a platform, a common denominator for a conversation to begin to grow. I don't know that this, conversa this conversation is not new to American history, mm -hmm. and it's been proven right. throughout the, the years. We've had discussions in, in the past, should the, the language be German or should it be English? We've had, you know, English only. Florida, where Hispanics vote in significant proportions, we just got the DREAM Act this year yeah. in a state like Florida. If in Florida it was that difficult, and you have a strong number of Hispanics that vote, and vote is so important, mm -hmm. what does that tell you about how difficult it is in states where you don't have right. that large Hispanic community, and Hispanic population that is actually politically active? It's just really difficult. It's it very is. complex. And yet, we've made huge strides. How do we keep that going, Barbara? Well, I'm not quite sure how to address that question, but you did ask earlier about comprehensive reform as opposed to a more piecemeal approach. And, and I tend to favor the more piecemeal approach. I've seen comprehensive in two major bills now. Dodd-Frank is the one that just vastly affects my industry for, from my perspective, for no reason whatsoever, because the 14,000 financial institutions that had nothing to do with the economic downturn are being severely impacted in terms of being able to deliver their services to their customers and their members because of Dodd-Frank. So another comprehensive bill, frankly, frightens me in terms of what all is going to be in there besides immigration reform. But there are some simple things that can be done. When I went to Congress to talk to senators and, and representatives, Republicans and Democrats, they almost to a man and woman, agreed that the H-1B visa situation was something that needed to be fixed. The counter to that was, but we also need uh, to fix the 
the uh, visas for the lower skilled workers, for example, the agricultural workers, service workers. Fine, do that. Do the H-1B visas, do the lower skilled workers. Done, bang. There's some simple fixes here that could be done right away. There are some other very complex issues like border security and, and how you undertake that and how you fund that and all that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm concerned that we're waiting for this big magic pill that isn't necessarily going to do what we want it to do in a wide array of places. So what do you hear, do, what about that issue on, uh, in Congress that you hear, Randy? Um, well, McConnell, McConnell spoke to our board and he said if I had been in charge instead of Harry Reid, we would have done immigration. But this is before they talked about it in the House. Uh, we would have done it and uh, we would have broken it up into pieces. And McConnell has never been on the far right of this issue. He has voted no, but he hasn't been on the far right and spoken up against immigration reform. So he's got a plan. He's, spoken, he's certainly spoken to our board about a plan and breaking it up in various pieces. The, the, the conundrum is he can't politically to do, just do border first and do nothing. That's the easy one. It's, there's got to be a variety of triggers built in. You, we're going to have to do border first. The question then is, is what sort of triggers are concrete enough in there that if they're met, it will allow legalization, which H-1B is, I think, is separate, legalization and lesser skilled programs to move forward along with mandatory E-Verify. Uh, and those triggers we're talking about, uh, the Senate had some, they probably weren't arguably, some would say they weren't tough enough, but there's a way to beef those up. But they can be split up, but they've got to be sort of linked in a trigger sort of way to, to pass muster, I think, uh, on the left. Uh, I, I do want to jump in. Just the, the missing part of our, our puzzle here is state and local governments, and, and I guess they need to make a pitch here for coming back to, to demonstrating why immigrants are good for America. We have more state and local governments saying that, such as St. Louis and others, through the, through the Welcoming America initiative. And to me, that's so important because that's where people who are trying to revitalize their economies are saying, we need more immigrants to come into our communities, and if we get those more immigrants, that will help revitalize our communities because they are entrepreneurs, they are hardworking, and no, the stuff about them being, you know, on welfare and all that, forget it, that's not true. And if it was true, we wouldn't want them in our communities because it would erode our tax base. The opposite is true. The fact they're doing it belies those assertions, and the people who are making those assertions are those who really are looking at the bottom line. So we had a hard time getting the mayors engaged last time around. That's, that's on our to-do list, uh, Republican Governors Association. We tried. The governor of Michigan is super on this, Snyder. But I will say that he was, he was a lone army. Uh, obviously, we have presidential politics coming up in the next election. I'm going to hear how some of those candidates are going to play this. But I think that, that's another piece of the pie, to keep the story moving and, and, and to sort of make the, make the demonstration that this is good for America, it's good for American workers. I think we need to try and get the state and local government people engaged in a better way. Keeping it uber local. You mentioned what can we do. And I just want to mention something we've been working on for a number of years. And it really started grassroots. It didn't start with World Belief or even the immigration, Evangelical Immigration Table, which is a group of leaders organized around this event, faith leaders. But a, a group of young people put together a website called undocumented.tv. And in that, it was aimed at young people. It just began to tell stories, really through video. And they're really, um, they're great videos. And I, I just wonder if we don't take that idea and see if we can build upon that across the nation, tell and craft the really important stories, and if that wouldn't accompany all the advocacy and activism on the political front and see the hearts and minds of people shift. Um, leadership, the National uh, Immigration Forum has been very involved in that, and there's many others as well, but could we not scale that up? Some sort of undocumented TV, not just for a certain demographic, where we've seen success, but across the nation, and use that storytelling to open the hearts and, oh, by the way, on that website is all sorts of data, but it's the story, it's the video, it's the catchy story that opens the hearts, and then people sort of plunder the data and become convinced. So could we scale it up? Could we do that nationally? I think we can. I think we can, I think we we can have, have success there. We have questions that we're taking from the audience. There's this one question. Who most needs to hear compelling stories? John Boehner, my neighbors, my local news media, my own Congress representative, Senator? Who needs to, who are we messaging to? Who does that need to go to? Well, it's not John Boehner, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and going after him while he's having breakfast up at Pete's Diner, uh, it's not a good strategy. 
Um, but stalking, the stalking strategy. The stalking strategy is not, not when people are having breakfast. Uh, but you know, people got their own ideas. <laughs> But I th your, your local media, if you can get local media to run with it, that's, I think, that's a very interesting idea. And if they run to work, run with it and then people read that, uh, you get to the congressman through that. And then you also get people reading that who are constituents of that congressman. You had a list there. That would be number one in my view. I think the story needs to go local. I think you have to take over the communities. The idea that people don't know who an undocumented story, somebody who does, they might think that that wonderful person is the exception to the rule, not that right. national persona that's depicted, uh, but, the, but the hard truth is that those who are undocumented are living here, they're raising their families here, their kids go to school mm -hmm. in our schools, they're going to the same hospitals, they're going to the same churches, they're mowing someone's lawn, they're picking uh, the fruits, and are, are, they're in agriculture. Can we really say we don't know who they are? Mm -hmm. Honestly, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we really do know who they are. We're just not being honest to ourselves. I have a question for you all. What, what is the message that you would have for the Latino community? How would you say to the Latino community, Change your strategy, readdress your strategy, tell the story, tell it different, how, would, how to tell it. While you think about that, uh, how can the media help to change the language? I don't know if the language means from Spanish to English or if the language means illegals, undocumented, well, I think they've whatever. already tried to change the language. I, I, think, I think the tone's changed uh, dramatically and to, the, and to the better I think so. for all, for the Republican Party, for sure, but it's also been better for the country because it's more of a uniting, a more calming way to be able to bring this debate to a more intelligent conversation. Mm -hmm. I, this is just an idea off the top of my head, but we have PSAs public service announcements that the television stations have to run. And if there were some way to pull together some PSAs on this topic, telling the stories, giving some data, combining the two in a 30-second spot, if we could keep running those, it just becomes ingrained in the, in the population. I think, too, that the way, some of the way these stories are told do you hear those news media stories where they say uh, an illegal drunk driver hit a, a car and hit? Well, is the problem that the person was undocumented or is the problem that the person was a drunk driver? But just the idea, the illegal drunk driver, I guess it's yeah. okay if you're a, a legal drunk driver. It, it, it just seems the, the way the stories are told by the media does have a profound impact yeah. and it just goes to viewpoint that those who are here who without proper documentation are evil and I think the idea also of you are how can you be supporting someone who has broken the law well yeah. I mean, you know I, I, that's uh, of course we're, we should but, all strive to be law-abiding citizens but when you have a law that is almost, that is very difficult to abide by when you have great need. I, it, Jeb Bush said it uh, in an interview, uh, he understands that position that in, under similar circumstances, or I don't know if it was him or Marco Rubio, I mean, he, that, would do, he would do something similar. I think it was Jeb. I think it was, and Martin Luther King quoted St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas as well, an unjust law is no law at all. And I think we have something to stand on there, biblically, through our faith traditions, through our American story, that injustice or unjust laws need to be attended to. And I, I applaud the, the law enforcement community that actually out there on the front lines enforcing laws that they may not believe in. They're doing the right thing, but they're also advocating for change. I mean, applaud, applause to you all. To your comment about the faith, the Hispanic community, uh, their leadership, I, I would applaud them. I think they're doing stellar work uh, on their, uh, in leadership and their strategy. And I think there is a critical mass 
I really do. I think their strategy is working. I think it needs to grow and it needs to build into the movement that we um, are hoping for. So maybe they would say there's change in strategy, but I think they need our help in leading what they've been doing for many, many years. And quite frankly, uh, suffering under this burden of leadership much longer than myself or many of my colleagues. So I, my hat's off to them. And I think we have a lot that we, that we owe them and uh, that we can do more with them. One of our earlier panelists uh, talked about brain studies and, and cautioned against the messages that keep getting sent through the media. And that's why I think the media is an incredibly powerful force to change this narrative. And I think also that um, for the Latino community, getting the message out in English is important because we have so much media in Spanish language that right. we speak to each other, but we have to speak to the broader community, which I think is important. Education, of course, is absolutely right. critical and greater access to education, which is absolutely important. But I think also speaking more openly, candidly, perhaps um, less belligerently to the different political parties is also very helpful. Mm -hmm. Because I think that sometimes the antagonistic tones doesn't help the conversation from the Latino side. No, it's just you know, how the polling, and Jeb Bush pointed this out in his book, if you poll the Latino community, immigration is important, but, but a lot of, as you know, a lot of the principles align themselves with principles of the Republican Party. And yet, and yet the side that always gets out in the media is really the more acerbic, we want immigration, we want immigration now. And so people then associate, well, if we do that, then they're all going to vote for Democrats, uh, which is okay if you're a Democrat, but it's not okay if you're a Republican. And yet that's the story that gets out, even though if you look at the surveys, so I guess that's a long way of saying, if the, for the Latino community, to, if there was, and I know they have their own party leaders, uh, to get out and say, you know, when you look at all these things, we actually could very well be strong Republicans, but give us a shot. Uh, and, and I will maybe, out of 10 I'm thinking of, I can think of one guy who, who says that. Uh, and certainly the media doesn't pick up on that message. But if there were, that doesn't mean we want immigration, but give us a shot, get past immigration. And we are, we could very well be good Republicans. Uh, and that's what I say to my friends in the Republican Party. One, if we can't convince them to be Republicans in 13 years, which is what the Senate provided, then shame on us. Uh, but secondly, if you look at, at, this, at the kind of surveys, it's not that hard to bring them into the Republican Party. So don't be afraid of, of legalization. They're all going to vote for Democrats. It's, it's not true. But that's part. The other part, frankly, the Latino, not that they would ever ask my advice on this, hang too much dirty laundry out in the press and just keep, don't talk about all the wars in between the Latino groups and the Democratic Party. Uh, I read these stories. I'm like, these people still want to get their name in the press. Why are they like talking so much? And the media just feeds on that, and then it's one group against the other, and then it's the Latinos against Obama, and, and uh, it's just, and the Republicans then see that. Uh, that's, that's a message. I would just say, don't hang the dirty laundry out in the public so often. Well, we know the media that sells most is the most controversial media. And I think most talk shows, evening, at least on the national scene, is set up to be controversial and to polarize right. because it creates that sense of angst and more people tune in. And yet, what we're seeing in this room across faith and business and law enforcement is moral courage. You see people who are in this room and others around the nation that have taken a step of courage, even possibly disenfranchising some of their colleagues and friends. What if we see in media the same courage? And what if we were to see leaders in media to actually talk about the radical middle and actually bring together into the center? Because it's not that complicated. We can do this and not follow the typical format of polarization. Actually come out and say, you know, we're not gonna do what we're supposed to do. And that is polarize an issue so we get the ratings. And we're gonna talk about the middle because we wanna actually shift hearts and minds towards what is not so difficult to do. I think we could see some great courage across media. You're a great example. I, I love the radical middle. Final thoughts, best way to tell the American story, the immigration story, Randy. Well, really, the best way I think overall is, is you sort of start out with is, is all, our, all, our, all our relatives are immigrants, and you got to keep reminding people about that. Uh, I mean, mine were German, Swedish, and as you said, you go back and they were hated too. If you go, if you, actually, if you go back and look at the history books, the stuff that's being said now is tame compared to what they were saying back then in terms of Germans and Italians. Uh, but that, that is the strength of this country. And, and, and Stephen, you started out, off with that, and, and I think people. 
I think that's the way, because you, you got to come back to that, and that's the way you personalize it. Uh, and, and when you say to, like, my 95-year-old mother who's pissed off at McDonald's because you can't understand the, behind the person behind the register, Mom, they want to learn English. And if you look at the statistics, people who come to this country don't want to be, stay balkanized. They want to become Americans just like you and, and Dad did and, and your parents. And that's, I, I think that's true. And you got to get past that, and people think about it, and they're like, yeah, okay. But you've got to bring it down to that soundbite uh, and, and in a way that personalizes it to everyone. And I think it's because everybody was immigrants, and they, except for, you know, we got the Mayflower people, and there's not so many of them around here anymore. But, uh, and there ain't that many anyways. So uh, I think that's the way. The other one is we've talked about the more, the broader stories and the data and all that. But you really kind of get this down to, you know, in 15 seconds, how can you get, make people to rethink their position? Barbara? I agree. We're all from someplace for the most part. And so we just have to keep reminding everybody of that. You asked a question earlier about what, what should we tell the Latino community about doing. And I would say, reach out. Don't stay within your own community. Don't stay within your Spanish language stations and, and radio. Reach out to the rest of America and tell us your story. Yeah, mine would be very simple, and it's just simply to tell people to meet an immigrant and get to know their story, and then tell their story. And there's, there, we know them. They're everywhere, and uh, we need to tell their story. And, and, you know, the question we need to ask ourselves as a nation, what do we want to tell our kids? Do we want to say to our kids and grandkids, we kept the illegals out? Is that the nation we want to be? No. We're a great nation. We found a way to bring them in to, to, remain, uh, to remain legal, to enforce the borders, and to, and to build upon the innovation that this country has succeeded on. And our faith communities will thrive, our economy will thrive, our nation will be great because we're good. The American story is the immigrant story. Plainly right. simple. And it's a very local story, it's a deeply personal story. Right. And if we make it personal and deep and thoughtful, it will resonate. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. What a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, now I just have four hours of comments to close us out. Is that okay? Boy, okay, maybe not. Tough crowd all of a sudden. All right, big hand for the uh, panel again. Thank you. So um, this is the plan right now. I want your opinion. I just want, you know, really quickly, just tell me from the floor, what do you think about today? Uh, and then we've got a, uh, in that, the little room back there, we've got some refreshments. We're gonna, we want your opinion, we want some, you know, some, a little bit of time for, you know, just grab a cookie. We'd love your, your sense of kind of where this goes, but I'm not gonna talk much here. I want your sense of, okay, what was today about? Was it good, bad, otherwise? What did you like about it? Eddie. out to, get, uh, to help support this effort, especially as we look at integration being a critical component. So I just want to thank the forum for that. Thank you, thank you. Other quick thoughts here? Other quick thoughts? Uh, in the back. Mark's gonna get a workout here. I'm Dave Drury from the Wesleyan Church and the new Immigration Alliance that was talked about earlier by uh, Stephen. Uh, I was in a meeting last week with uh, Gabe Salguero, who many of you know from NALEC, and he said uh, this line. He, it was, it's an African proverb, and he says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
And that keeps, keeps ringing in my ears when I think about how we're all working together. And I mean, many of you in the room, and I've heard some of the stories around our table and in the hallways today, you've been working on this for a while. <laughs> some of you for a decade or more. I know one person at our table has been doing it since I was in high school. Uh, thank you. It's worth it to work together on this. And I just don't think we're going to go far enough if we don't stay together on it. And I know some of us have come in kind of discouraged about this movement. And I would just say in advance, thank you for the efforts now. It will make a difference and we can do it together. Uh, the founder of our movement, John Wesley, said, if your heart is as my heart, give me your hand. I think we've got a lot of diversity in here of different opinions on a thousand things. The panelists have had diverse experiences and opinions on all sorts of things. Uh, but I think we can come together and say we have the same heart for this and it matters, it makes a difference. So I just want to say thank you. I'm grateful and in advance for when this finally happens uh, and when we really see opportunity uh, develop and access and the status we know that is needed, it's going to make a huge difference for this whole country. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Other quick reactions, other quick comments to today? I think one of the most important things that I have, have heard here is that we just need to keep on telling our story um, until we get it right. And I, I've worked on this for probably over the last 20 years, and I have really seen this story progress and become broader and more meaningful to more people. So I think that we just you know, keep the faith and you keep on working, and you get better at it, and you tell your story, and finally, people are just going to get it. That's great. Thank you. Well, again, thank you very, very much. Peter, real quick, please. Yes. We need to convince our Republican friends, politicians, and others that they are victims of the wrong messengers. Hmm. That's perfect. I think there we go. That's the perfect last word. Because this is the room of the right messengers. This is the room where we have perspectives from the faith community, law enforcement, the veterans community, business, who have worked together for years, and I think there's a deep commitment to continue to work together. So just to repeat, the things that we want to do in the next, in the time ahead, number one, we want to define the opportunity skills status agenda. We want to be able to work with you over the next four months to do that. Number two, we want to tell the story about the contributions and the value of immigrants and immigration. And number three, we want to keep working towards impacting policy. Because yes, we're talking about 2020, but between now and 2020, there are multiple legislative opportunities, there are multiple electoral cycles for us to be able to use this agenda to educate and engage policymakers. So please join us for a quick snack at the back. We'd love your opinion uh, in, a, in a, a tighter um, uh, uh, setting. And we are incredibly grateful for all of you making the trip and for the very, very thoughtful uh, back and forth. And all the panelists, all the moderators over the course of the day, it was just an incredible conversation. So thank you very much.